the devil is only afraid of Christians trying to fly in prayer who've got a bit of life in them. He's not worried about religion. He's not worried about prayers. But Christians who are really trying to pray in the name of Jesus, that gets him really worried. And therefore, he attacks at that point. As the little jingle puts it, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Don't underestimate the devil and don't treat him as a joke. But he does tremble when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. I believe that when you come to know the Lord, you come to know the devil at the same time. And if someone says to me, well, I don't have any experience of the devil, I've never come across the devil, I honestly wonder how far they've gone with the Lord. Because as I said two weeks ago, the devil is not in hell tonight, he's in heaven. The book of Job makes that quite clear. He patrols the earth, but his home is heaven. And we wrestle against the powers of evil, not in the hellish places, but in the heavenly places. That's where they are. And when you really get through to the Lord, you get through to Satan, because that's where he is. He is in the heavenly places, and he's up there. And when you get through up there in prayer, you get through to him as well as to the Lord Jesus. And that's why prayer becomes a real difficulty. Now, the first thing in any battle is to define your enemy, to identify your enemy. Before you decide how you can overcome him, you've got to identify him. You've got to be sure you've identified the right enemy. Never pray against people, because you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Human beings are not the enemies. We are wrestling against beings without bodies. We are wrestling against the devil himself in prayer, and it is a real battle. Now let me just tell you a bit about the devil first, so that you've got a clear picture in your mind of what we're praying against. Christians are called not only to pray for people, but to pray against certain persons chief of whom is Satan himself. Let me then tell you something of what the Bible says about him. First of all, the Bible does not paint him as a horned creature with a forked tail. That's the sort of thing that makes us laugh at him, take him less than seriously. See, the Bible says he's a real person. The Bible never calls the devil it, always he. Next, the Bible says that he has a heart and a mind and a will. And if a heart and a mind and a will don't make a personality, I don't know what does talks about the devil's feelings, talks about his thoughts, and it talks about his motives. And that means to me a person. So the devil is not just a, a kind of vague word to sum up all the forces of evil in the world. Now Jesus himself took Satan desperately seriously. He never made a joke about him. He never laughed at him. He never caricatured him. Here are some of the titles that Jesus gave Satan. He said he is the prince of this world. When Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, Jesus did not say they are not yours to give, because he knew perfectly well they were Satan's to give. And it is a, a horrible thought, if you really realize it, that the world in which we live is ruled over by Satan. He is the prince of this world, but let's take it a step further. Do you know that another title Jesus gave to Satan? He said he's not only the ruler or prince of this world, he is the God of this world. The only other person beside his heavenly father to whom Jesus ever applied the word God was Satan. He said, my heavenly father is God of everything, but of this world, Satan is God, which means very simply not only that Satan controls this world and is able to manipulate science and education and politics for his own ends. More than that, Satan is actually the real God whom most people on earth worship, whether they know it or not. That behind so much religion, behind so much activity, Satan is the one who's being worshipped. He's the person. And even by some who go to church and chapel on Sunday, in reality, he's their God. For they worship the things that he offers them. They want the things of the world that he belongs to and rules over, rather than setting their mind on the things that are above where Jesus is. And if you want this world, and if you want the things of this world, then I give you a piece of advice. Make Satan your God. If you want this world, he's a wonderful God to have because he'll give it to you. There's only one snag. There's always a price to pay. When the bill comes in, you may not be quite so happy, but he'll give it to you. He can give you money. He can give you fame. He can give you anything you want because it's his to give. Where have you been, Satan, says God in the book of Job? Well, I've been patrolling the earth. I've been looking around my estate. 
and he had. Now let's get this clear, that doesn't mean that God is helpless in this world. It does mean, and we've got to think this through, that God is allowing Satan to be prince of this world and God of this world. He's allowed it. And people say, what does God think he's doing allowing that? Well, I would just say my only answer to that one is, what's he doing allowing you to be like you are? Why should you blame him for allowing Satan to rebel when he allowed you to? The answer is very simple. He's a father and he will not force any of his creatures to go his way. And he gives you freedom to rebel. And we can't grumble about him giving the angels freedom, though they have superior intelligence and strength, because he gave us the same freedom and we've used it in the wrong way. The true Christian takes the devil very seriously indeed. Some of you listening, listening to me tonight just know how seriously you take him. I, I just hope you never do have a direct encounter with him. Because it's pretty scary. And you can only come through it because you know that he's an al already a defeated foe. Do you know there are two books in the Bible that the devil hates? More than any other two books in the Bible out of all 66, there are two that say more about him than any others. And it's these that he has attacked more than any others. They are the one at the beginning and the one at the end. Genesis and Revelation. And you know why he hates them? Because Genesis describes his devices and Revelation describes his doom. And he hates those two books. And there has been more scholarly attack on the book of Genesis than any other book and more attempt to turn it into myth and legend and away from fact than any other book in the Bible. Why? Because Satan doesn't want you to believe that Genesis 3 ever happened. He doesn't want you to know how he got hold of Eve. He doesn't want you to believe that he said what he did to that first married couple. And he attacks the book of Genesis but the other book which he hates more than any other is the book of Revelation. Because as you read through that book, you come to a point where it says that the devil himself will be cast into the lake of fire. He'll be bound in prison first and not allowed to trouble men. And then he'll finally be put in the lake of fire. He, he so hates that bit. I must tell you that the Bible makes it absolutely clear that Satan is already a defeated foe. And if he gets hold of you, he's bluffing you. Call his bluff. If you've been baptized, say, Satan, I'm not only dead, I'm buried. You're talking to a dead man. Don't you know that in baptism you were buried with him? You were buried. That's the point of baptism, to have a funeral of someone who's died. And the funeral helps you to say goodbye to an old life. It, it says, that's finished, that's the last time I see that. Life. And Satan doesn't like people getting baptized for that reason. He doesn't like us having a public funeral of someone who's died. Because you see, when you reckon yourselves dead and call his bluff and say, I'm dead and buried, and Satan, you saw my funeral, whether it was a mill meet or commercial road or somewhere else, you were present at my funeral service, I'm dead and buried, stop tempting me. You will find to, the, to your extraordinary delight that he has to go. Resist the devil and he'll run from you. And you resist him on the ground of fact, and on the ground of the Word of God. Well, that's the real battle that's on. Let me now then talk about his relationship to prayer. What we can do to the devil in prayer. Now, this is exciting. We can lay him flat in prayer. We are told in the New Testament, we are to take the initiative against him. Do you know that Jesus told us to pray every day about the devil? Do you know that? The original prayer that he taught his disciples when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, pray like this. Say, Dad, in heaven. Then pray for the things he wants. His name. His will. His kingdom. Then he said, pray for the things you need. You need food. You need forgiveness. Then he said, finish by praying this. Deliver us from the evil one. And I think it's tragic that English versions have got away from that. We've turned evil into a thing in our thinking. It's not a thing, it's a person. There's no evil anywhere in the universe apart from persons. Evil is an intensely personal thing. There's no love in the universe apart from persons who love. And so evil is personal. And Jesus said, pray daily, deliver us from the evil one. 
Start your prayer by thinking of your dad in heaven, but end your prayer by thinking of the devil on earth and go out to face him. And so we can deliver through prayer from the power of the evil one. Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10. Last of all, I want to remind you that your strength must come from the Lord's mighty power within you. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand safe against the strategies and tricks of Satan. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies, the evil rulers of the unseen world, those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. So use every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy whenever he attacks, and when it is all over, you will still be standing up. But to do this, you will need the strong belt of truth and the breastplate of God's approval, wear shoes that are able to speed you on as you preach the good news of peace with God, in every battle you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. And you will need the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray all the time. Ask God for anything in line with the Holy Spirit's wishes. Plead with Him, reminding Him of your needs, and keep praying earnestly for all Christians everywhere.